Thank you. It's uh, really great to be with you and be in this uh, marvelous uh, facility here in the Northwest. North, yeah, Northwest. Uh, <laughs> it's wonderful always to come here and see all the, um, the, the innovations and the things that everybody's doing. And um, when Mother Earth News asked me to kind of uh, wind up their fairs for this year, um, I put together a talk that I thought uh, 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 captured the way a lot of us feel. Um, you know, we come here and it's so wonderful, isn't it, to wander and, and, uh, and talk to people that are um, innovative and hopeful and, and uh, th th just, just uh, you know, this is a tribe, it, it, it's a tribe. And, um, and the thought that's, that I've had a lot about lately is um, that we represent a, a heresy in our day. And so I thought, well, I'd talk about, uh, about heretics uniting. You know, we're all heretics here, unless there's some Monsanto plant in the audience. <laughs> we'll take him out in a gurney later. Um, <laughs> I haven't even gotten started yet. But you know, you know, among our friends, neighbors, and especially family, you know, those people, those family people, um, there is an orthodoxy of thought, an orthodoxy of thought in our culture. Uh, I want you to think back throughout history and think about, um, for example, the first time somebody suggested that the earth was round and not flat. Move it down. Is that better? Is that better? How's that? Is that even better? Good, okay, I'm always interested in advice. That's good, that's good. So, so imagine being the guy that said, you know, that the earth is round and not flat. I mean, can you imagine the, the, the ostracism, the, the, what are you talking about? Don't you know if you go out in the Pacific Ocean far enough, you're going to fall across the edge and you'll see Atlas there underneath, you know, holding up the, the earth as you go by. I mean, this was, everybody knew that the earth was flat. You look out there, it's not round, it's flat. Look, you can look, it's flat. But then suddenly there was a day when there was this big kind of, you know, universal aha moment. Oh, you know, the earth are round. You know, the, 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 imagine being the guy that said, um, the earth revolves around the sun. What do you mean the earth revolves around the sun? I get up in the morning, I go move my, you know, my chickens and my cows, and, um, and I go plant my, and the sun comes up. See, it comes, it comes up over there along the edge of the flat earth. You know, the sun uh, rises, it, it, it moves around the earth. What do you mean the earth is, the earth is revolving around the sun? That's crazy talk. Um, you know, you, you move into the, um, the bubonic plague era, and you can see all these amazing woodcuts of the spirits, the spirits of disease. And they had all these names of, you know, consumption and, and plague and all these things, you know. And, and there were these different uh, types of spirits with a scythe, you know. It was the old Grim Reaper, right? And, and he had all different kinds of manifestations in these woodcuts about the spirits. And, and imagine, you know, the first time people realized that there were microscopic beings. Look in the microscope, I'll wow, see these little things running around. They're not ghosts, they're not, you know, grim reapers carrying a scythe. Uh, they're, they're, little, they're little beings, you know. And now we know that they actually talk to each other. I don't know if they speak English or French or, you know, Turkestan or whatever, but, but they, 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 they speak to each other. And now, you know, the, the, the bacteria in the soil, you know, there's all these billions and billions of bacteria in the soil, and we have three trillion inside of us. Three trillion, I mean, MIT now says we are 85% non-human. We're only 15% human. You know, if you can look at each of us with an electron microscope, we lo all look like, uh, like Pigpen in the Peanuts comic strip, you know, with this, with this aura of, of you know, things all floating around us and in us, you know. And, 
And I always think now when I go to the garden and, and, and pull a, you know, pull a, a like kind of fresh asparagus or a lettuce leaf or something, you know, or pull a carrot and just, you know, kind of wipe the dirt off on your pants and just eat it, you know, that all that bacteria in that soil, it's all full of rich in compost and humus and all that stuff. You know, that soil, you know, I eat that soil and it comes down into my uh, three trillion member bacteria, you know, and, and, and they're all greeting these soil bacteria, you know, cousin, hi, you know, how are you doing? <laughs> but we now understand that death and disease is not caused by these little fairy, fairy, you know, fairy spirits and things running around. Uh, how about a time um, it, it, when, when we thought as a culture and others thought that uh, the slavery was, was perfectly fine and this was a, this was a great way to uh, um, you know, live and, and do things and get labor. Uh, slavery is wonderful. Um, leeches. You know, leeches and bloodletting are the way that we stop disease, you know. And if you've got a problem, we, you know, we, it, it, it's the bad humor in you, you know, that red blood, you know, that's a bad humor. We've got to, you know, get it out of there. Um, so we bled everybody to death. Um, you know, moving a little closer home, how about, you know, 40 years ago when the U.S. duh, U.S. duh, I call it the U.S. duh and the F. duh, all right, and, um, the, the, the U.S. Dub began uh, taking farmers like me to free steak dinners to teach us this new scientific, progressive, high-tech way of growing, feeding cows where we grind up dead cows and we feed them back to cows, right? I mean, you know, uh, this, was, this, was the, this was the orthodoxy, see? This was the orthodox doctrine. And, and, and heretics like me, who questioned it, who dared to question the orthodoxy of the most credentialed, you know, alphabet soup experts in our culture, said maybe this isn't the way we should go. You know, we were ostracized, we were, we were um, um, labeled as Luddites, Neanderthals, anti-progressive, you know, science haters. You want to go back to the dark ages, you know. Here we are 40 years later, and suddenly there was this big, you know, universal, oops, maybe we shouldn't ought to done that. <laughs> As the planet realized that it wasn't the right thing to do with bovine spongiform encephalopathy, okay? Otherwise known as mad cow. Yeah, if you learn to say bovine spongiform encephalopathy, you don't have to have a clue what it means, but it makes you sound real smart when you can say it. So just practice some big words, you know, and, and, and you know, it's kind of like the, the, uh, the names in the Bible in the Old Testament, you know. You don't have to know them or know what they mean, just learn how to say a couple of them and people will think you're really smart. Um, but, but, you know, th this idea, this was the, you have to understand this was the orthodoxy of our day. How many of our tax dollars went to research, to do free seminars and free steak dinners, to promote and teach this orthodoxy of feeding dead cows to cows? And we're still feeding chicken feathers and dead chickens and chicken manure you know, to cows. That's what our neighbors do in their feedlots. They clean out their chicken houses and they put them in white bologna tubes and sile them and mix them with about 50% corn silage, and that's your steak dinner down at the, um, you know, at, at Applebee's. <laughs> and of course, now we're in the throes of another orthodoxy of our day. Genetically modified organisms are the salvation of the future. A bunch of heretics. And, and, and that's the orthodoxy of our day. And it doesn't matter whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. It doesn't matter. When you go, you vote for additional GMOs. I mean, that's the orthodoxy. And so I think it's important to appreciate that every time period in history has its orthodoxy. And that the, the, the solutions, when, when history looks back, on the solutions that the orthodoxy, the, 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 the problems that the orthodoxy created, the solutions were always promoted, found out, 
and explained by the heretics. And so there is, there is a, a, a definite you know, uh, uh, inquisition going on. Um, toward those of us who would dare to question the orthodoxy of our day. So I have a couple of these orthodoxy points that I want to that I want to point out to help us as we talk to family and friends and neighbors because the problem is that our orthodoxy becomes our our cultural shared uh, paradigm, doesn't it? It, it, it? It's that unquestioned kind of cultural subconscious, right? Well, that's what I want to talk about. That was just a pre ramble. Okay. <laughs> The first one is that nature, you ready for this? Nature is fundamentally broken and we have to fix it. That's an orthodoxy of our day. You know, when our neighbors have a, have a sick cow, their first assumption is, oh, um, she's pharmaceutically disadvantaged. <laughs> I mean, that's the first thought. You know, if they have fungus on the cucumber, you know, powdery mildew, the first thought is, oh, I didn't use the right fungicide. The, 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 the assumption is that, man, if it weren't for us and our toxic rescue chemistry, as Charles Walters used to call it, we, well, we, we wouldn't survive. My goodness, thank goodness for Merck Pharmaceuticals and, you know, Pfizer and Johnson and Johnson and Bayer, you know, Pharmaceuticals. I mean, we, we just couldn't survive without them. Um, a, a sick plant didn't receive enough chemicals. Uh, you know, a sick animal is pharmaceutically disadvantaged. You know, uh, Wendell Berry writes about this. He, he says that uh, it's interesting that um, we have decided that what's wrong with us creates more gross domestic product than what's right with us. And, and he writes about this in the home economics, you know, where he says, he says, you know, if you've got a, you've got a happily married couple with nice, you know, uh, exuberant, inspired, um, uh, non-computer literate children, um, or non-video game addicted children, maybe I should say, um, and, and, and you, you know, you're growing your garden and you're milking your cow and you're only driving one car and, and one of the spouses is staying home, I'm going to be very unsexist here, um, and and you, you, you know you have a one a one income household. You grow all of your own food. You have your own honey bees, and you you know you, you maybe even have a llama and an alpaca, and you spin and you make your own. But anyway, that you you make this 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 home centric economy. Well, it doesn't drive Wall Street. That just puts money in your pocket. There's no economic activity. In fact, there's not a lot of money actually changing hands. But you let all that crumble in dysfunction, you know, a divorce, and now we have to have two households instead of one, two workers instead of one, two cars instead of one. Now we get to buy psychoanalysis and psychotherapy for the kids that are all dysfunctional and messed up, and we can't buy, we can't grow our own food because we're all working in town, and so now we have to buy from the supermarket, and now we get sick because of microwavable this and GMO that, and so we get to buy pharmaceuticals. That drives GDP! <laughs> and so I think, it's a, I think it's a valuable thing to understand that our whole uh, uh, economic system and the way we measure societal success all depends on things being wrong with us. That's what drives success. You know, more surgeries, more prisons, more therapy, more sheep dip and hazardous material suits. The heretics say that nature's default position is wellness. That nature is very fine, thank you very much, and we can actually get along a lot better if we look at the templates and the patterns in nature and follow those patterns so that we actually create a terrain of health that is not about germs and viruses, but it's about creating a terrain of immunological function. You know, um, many of you may not be aware right now that uh, right, right now as we sit here, 
one in four piggies born in the United States is dying from epidemic porcine viral diarrhea. It's, it's, got, the, it's got the pork industry on its heels. Fu pork futures doubled in 40 days in January and February. That, that, that has never happened before. That was a brand new phenomenon. Epidemic porcine viral diarrhea. It's killing one-fourth of all the baby pigs born in the U.S. Now, I, I tell you what, if there's one thing worse than diarrhea, it's got to be viral diarrhea. Okay? But the industry doesn't know how to solve it. And they're desperately trying to come up with a vaccine, a medication, a pharmaceutical, some sort of fix. But it never occurs to them that maybe there shouldn't be a confinement hog facility. You know? Because, because part of the orthodoxy of our day is that life is fundamentally mechanical and not biological. The belief that life is fundamentally, fundamentally mechanical is the cause of the problem. You know, the only question we ask is can we grow plants and animals, can we grow them faster, fatter, bigger, and cheaper? That's the only question. We don't ask questions about how to grow happy pigs or, or physiologically, phenotypically expressed tomatoes. You know, all the research in tomatoes on the last 40 years has not been about how to increase nutrition or taste. It's all been how do we create a cultivar that can withstand 3,000 miles jostling in the back of a truck from California to, you know, Virginia. And when that's the only question, you get a cardboard tomato that tastes like cardboard. See? So, so our orthodoxy defines the research and, and the things that we actually ask. You know, we all understand intuitively that just faster, fatter, bigger, cheaper can't be very, a very noble goal. If it were, we'd all aspire to be the fattest person in the room. You know, the average NFL football player is dead at 57. Why? When your neck is bigger than your head, you're a freak of nature, and nature weeds you out. Nature's not just mechanical. Nature is fundamentally biological. I mean, our, our paradigm dates back to Justice von Liebig, who in 1837, using vacuum tubes, uh, presented his new orthodoxy to the world that, guess what I've just discovered? All life, every plant, every person, every animal is just a rearrangement of three things, nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. That's it. And that's been the orthodoxy ever since. Heretics believe that there's a difference between machines and life. You know what one of the biggest differences is? Life can heal. Machines don't. If you leave here today and you go home in your car and, and you're driving down the expressway and suddenly you hear this terrible grinding, you know, bump, 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 bump in your front right uh, wheel bearing, you can stop the car and, and you can go around and you can apologize, oh, I'm sorry I didn't lubricate you, I'm sorry I didn't, you know, whatever. You know, Do you want to take a rest? Rest a little while, you know, we'll, we'll just wait, we'll just wait, okay, it'll be fine. You can rest for five years. What's going to happen when you get up and start running again? Thump, thump, thump. But we can all be incredibly grateful that we're blessed that life can forgive and heal. We can abuse each other and forgive. We can say an unfit word to our spouse and be forgiven. We can mistreat a plant and then remediate with, you know, compost tea and some, you know, squirrel dung tea extract and 
some humates and some electromagnetic calypso, wah, 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 you know, music to make the stomata open up. And we can remediate that. And living things can heal. There's a big difference. So, healing the damage can only ultimately come when we appreciate that life is fundamentally biological and not mechanical. And there's a fundamental difference between those two. <clears throat> Next point of orthodoxy in our current culture. Efficiency requires monospeciation. We can't have multiple species on farms. I mean, the, the, the FDA, you know, has just put out this uh, proposed Food Safety Modernization Act. Are you up on that? And the proposed rules are that you, sh you cannot have animals and human edible plants on the same farm <laughs> because of cross-contamination. You know, right now in California, the mescaline mix growers, you know, have a, a, um, an annihilation zone. If they go out and happen to find a deer turd in their field, uh, uh, perish the thought, they've got to, uh, you know, eradicate, fumigate, and annihilate out within about 25 feet to make sure there's no contamination. What does it say about a food system when we've got to view our wildlife as an enemy? I mean, they've got to sign affidavits that nobody under five years old can visit the farm. Why? We don't want any diapers there. What does it say about the intimacy of partaking of food when our children can't even part be, a, be involved with it? Pick a radish, pet a chicken. What, you know, what does that say? You know, and so we've got this orthodoxy that the only way to be efficient is to have concentrated animal feeding operations, to have single species farms. You know, we, can't, we can't have um, um, sheep and chickens and cherries on the same farm. It's either, either be sheep or chickens or cherries. We can't have both kinds. Single-use infrastructure, we can't make multiple-use, I mean, perish the thought that we would actually have a building that would have an animal in it sometimes of the year and a plant in it sometimes of the year and perish the thought that we would have plants and animals in it at the same time. My goodness, they'd flip out coming to our farm and we've got, we've got rabbits and pigs and chickens all in the same place at the same time. You know, chickens up above, pigs underneath, rabbits over here, you know. And then they all come out, and they've all debugged it and compost, you know, created with the deep bedding. And then we plant tomatoes and corn and peppers and cantaloupes and melons right in that debugged bedding. By the time the bugs get up, the animals come in, debug it, send it. Multispeciation is, is, is the way to create confused pathogens if you do it right. And confused pathogens are a good thing. You know, the orthodoxy says um, that, that we have to have linear marketing channels. You know, you can't have, you can't have multiple kinds of things coming off a truck. I mean, there was a big uh, agenda in Virginia several years ago to help small farmers, you know, get going. And, um, and during the Senate hearings, I asked the, uh, the guy that was in charge of the small farm initiative that was with uh, Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, VDAX, um, I said, in your opinion, what does, a, what does a small lot load from a farm look like? He said, well, a tractor trailer load. That would be the smallest that, that, that would be possible. I said, well, okay, that's the orthodoxy of our day. You know, the farm bill subsidizes six things, only six things. I don't want it to subsidize any more things. But the point is that it, that it, that it, picks, it picks very single-use things, and it's all, it's all geared to single-use acres. You know, and people, there's, a, there, there's apparently some sort of a great machismo thing, you know, when you see, you know, eight, eight uh, $400,000, 20-foot combines going down a Kansas wheat field, you know, and, and, and men go, whoa, ah, oh, you know, look at that, look at that machinery, look at that diesel fuel, you know, wow. We get to justify sending our military to Iraq to make sure we can keep funneling these things. Oh, I'm a man. 
you, you got to be a, you got to be a, um, a a bit of a sissy, you know, to be an organic farmer. I mean, you know, you come in and, and your your loving wife Matilda says, uh, well, you know, my you know Hank. Uh, Hank, my, you know, my man's man, uh, what have you been doing today, you know? And it just doesn't sound manly to say, well, I made the pigs happy. It just, it just doesn't sound, you know, it sounds a lot more manly to say, I smell the diesel fuel under my thighs, I've been running pig iron, you know, smell it, you know, petroleum, yeah! I mean, single-use processing facilities. I mean, we don't want to. We don't want to have tomatoes going in the same factory as we have cherries. Well, we can't do that. I mean, and we can't be. We can't be killing. We can't be slaughtering chickens on the same concrete floor that next week we slaughter a beef or a lamb on. No, it, it's all got to be single speciated. You know, the average worker in today's processing plant, food processing plant, the average worker's job can be taught in 20 minutes. Now how would you like to be employed for a job that can be taught in 20 minutes? That sounds like just the thing that I'd like to do. But heretics like us, we embrace diversity and multi-speciation. We look around and we say, Nature doesn't like single speciation. There is no single speciation single, spe single speciation anywhere on the planet. There's all this diversity. I mean, even on the wall of a building, boom, you know, you got you got trees, you got, you know, vines growing up. I mean, there's all sorts of strange things. Nature loves diversity, and so heretics endorse the permaculture concept, for example, of stacking, where we stack you know, uh, root crops and then vines and then bushes and then lightly canopy trees and we, we espalier things and we, and, we, and we stack multiple things. You know, on our, on our pastures, you know, we're running turkeys and layers and broilers and cows and, and, and you, you stack these different things. We run pigs through, then we run cows through, then we run pigs back through again. And, and, and there's all these stacking, symbiotic, synergistic things. We like confused pathogens. And these systems are more productive. The fact is that the most rudimentary, novice-oriented backyard garden with diversity is far more productive per square yard than the most amazing National Geographic pictured industrial monospeciated farm. That's the truth. But we don't get traction. We don't get traction for our productive capacity because we're not using enough fuel. We're not, you know, it's, it's not big. It's not, you know, the scale isn't, whoa, you know, it's, it's, it's. You know, we, um, you know, we actually believe in jobs that take long enough to learn that they have enough craftsmanship and artistry and use enough different muscles that we don't get carpal tunnel syndrome. You know, so, um, my partner and I own a little federal inspected slaughterhouse, and so we've made a big deal about all of our workers being eclectic, knowing how to do everything, and we don't do the same thing every day. Why? So you use different muscles, you don't have carpal tunnel syndrome. We see nature as a pattern. Variety is beautiful and functional. We believe that farms should be aesthetically and aromatically sensually romantic that they shouldn't be so single species scaled that all the blessings like manure become liabilities of pollutants and that they stink up the neighborhood, that they're unsightly, that farming is actually an art, not just a linear factory science. <laughs> the next orthodoxy, you ready for this one? The home kitchen is unnecessary. Now we've been working on this for a long time. All right, uh, I mean this started a long time ago. Let others do the cooking. You know, the, the TV dinners, Velveeta cheese, and uh, uh, you know, heat and eat. 
I mean, to where now many um, um, townhouses and homes are being built without kitchens, but with what they call a breakfast nook. All you need is a microwave and a toaster so you can pop the top, pop the top part. Pop. <laughs> Put the pop tart in, okay, and, um, and you know, and, and nuke your, uh, you know, nuke your instant coffee, and you know, you're good to go. 49% of meals are now prepared outside the home. 70% of Americans at 4 p.m. have no clue what's for dinner. It's fascinating that we are now far more interested as a culture in the latest dysfunction in the Kardashian household than we are in what's going to become flesh of our flesh and bone of our bones at 6 o'clock. Convenience rules the day. When I, when I speak to foodie groups, urban foodie groups and college students, they say, you know, what's the, what, you know, name the first thing that we can do. And my answer is always, get in your kitchen. You know, you cannot have an integrity food system without a home-centric theme to life. <laughs> convenience rules the day. You know, it, it, it's all about convenience. No, we don't even have any family meals anymore. I mean, I was uh, doing a talk in D.C. the other day, and an art teacher came up to me. She said, I'm getting ready to retire. And being a very astute male, of course, said, you don't look nearly old enough to retire. Why? And she said, um, well, uh, because last week I had the students, uh, one of the first art projects always in the school year is to uh, have the students bring in a cooking pot to, for their first drawing. They're very easy, you know, they're pretty simple, clean lines, but they are different, you know, taller ones, squattier ones, different kinds of handles, that sort of thing. So there's enough difference so that each student, you know, has their own pot, but, but they're, they're very simple to draw. So, so last week, so I asked the 10th grade, 10th grade students, um, bring in a cooking pot tomorrow to class, and they all looked at me like I was from Pluto. I said, what's the problem? They said, we don't have a cooking pot in our house. So you don't have a cooking pot in your What do you cook in? We just put the box in the microwave. And this is, this is, assume, this is the orthodoxy. You know, nobody, nobody is assuming that this is wrong. Where's the outrage to this? That's just the way it's supposed to be. So food ignorance reigns the day, and we as a culture are becoming Food fearful, because you know you do fear what you don't know. I mean, we get calls from customers, can I thaw a chicken in, in can I thaw a ch ch chicken in the sink? Will it get salmonella and E. coli if it sits in the, yeah, you know, it's going to, no, the chicken's dead, you know. It's, it's, <laughs> it's done breathing, it's done eating, it's done pooping, trust me, you know. You can put it in your sink and it's fine. But. People are, are, are incredibly ignorant, I mean, uh, uh, and, and so, so they fear, they fear food, they, they don't know what it's supposed to taste like, look like, smell like, and of course, you know, we're, you know, we're eating all of the processed additives and things that, you know, that, uh, that have been put in uh, by, the, by the industry. The heretics, like us, we believe that home centricity is the foundation of integrity food. And that you can't so profoundly abdicate a visceral participatory role in something as intimate as our body's fuel and expect it to maintain its integrity. I mean, most of us are far more concerned about you know, the fuel in our cars than in our own bodies. And so we need to rediscover participation and integration. I call it rediscovering and jazzing up on domestic culinary arts. How about being addicted to domestic culinary arts more than we're addicted to playing the lottery or trying to go to Las Vegas or rent the next uh, Netflix movie? Okay. So the heretics like us, we encourage people to reinvent and reincorporate the larder. We don't even use the word anymore, larder. It used to be 80 years ago, if you came down here, 
and, and said, uh, where's the food in Puyallup? You drive down the road, and it would all be in everybody's larder. You know, dried beans, dehydrated apple slices, you know, smoked ham and, and different things, right? It would all be in everybody's larder. Today, it's all in a warehouse uh, a thousand miles away, dependent on a lot of petroleum and no Teamster strikes and, and favored nation status in order to, to get it to us. And that's a very fundamentally fragile system. If we get in the kitchen and prepare, process, package, and preserve our food using our techno gadgetry, we actually become heretics in the culture. And that's a good thing. I'm not asking us to go back to hoop skirts and hearth cooking and you know washboards, as romantic as that might sound to somebody who's never been there. Trust me, Grandma would give her eye teeth for the techno gadgetry we have today. I mean, we, you know, you go to the kitchen now, and you've actually got little spigots. One's got cold water, one's got hot water. Can you believe it? I mean, Grandma had to go get a, you know, a, a bucket and go to the, when you said go get water, it, it wasn't go to the kitchen sink, it was go to the spring or to the creek or whatever, right? Uh, I mean, we've got, we, we've got um, uh, ovens that, that, that just, you just turn them on. You, know, you don't have to go split kindling and start a little fire in, in a wood stove and wait for it to heat up, you know, and keep, you know. No, no, we, 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 got, we got thermometers built into these things. It's 300. Okay, ready. You know, we're going. We got time bank. I mean, you know, you can go to a thing like this, have a pot room. You got slow cookers. I mean, 40 watts. You dump stuff in in the morning. You come spend all day here. You go home in the evening, and you got this wonderful dinner all cooked on 40 watts of power. You know, if you've got an ADHD student, you can leave them pedaling a bicycle to generate the 40 watts all day. <laughs> You know, when I say get in the kitchen, I'm not talking about, you know, olden days of barefoot pregnant in the kitchen and not being able to go anywhere. I'm talking about using Cuisinart's ice cream makers, the kind of things you've seen in the cookware sections here, juice makers, uh, all sorts of cool gadgetry that we've got. Fermentation, you know, um, lacto-fermentation, making sauerkraut, eating seasonally. And I think that when we, create, when we create this larder in our homes, there's a spiritual significance because in a day when our orthodoxy is all about scarcity and running out of things, it's a, it's a soul salve to go to bed with your beloved at night surrounded by a larder of abundance. You know, the earth is not fundamentally a reluctant partner that we have to wrestle and make and do and you're going to produce for me and I'm going to get this out of you no matter what. It's actually a benevolent lover that responds to caress and nurturing and appreciation and wants to give us abundance. Next orthodoxy. <clears throat> uh, these things kind of uh, move in progression, so just bear with me. Uh, number four, the U.S. has a divine dispensation that makes us immune from collapse. <laughs> Isn't that an orthodoxy of our day? I mean, where, where is the congressman or the senator who, who, who really believes that we're on a collision course with nature's balance sheet. They're not around. You know, uh, everything is about growth. We got to grow. You know, remember, <laughs> cancer is a growth. <laughs> there are some things that shouldn't grow. Some things that, you know, did you realize that? I mean, this idea, uh, and I get so tired of every day in the newspaper reading some politician saying that we need this in order to move forward. Moving forward, we need it. Moving forward. You know, most of the time when they say to move forward, in my view, they're saying move backward. 
as if move forward um, um, it, it justifies any stupidity you can imagine. So what are some things that should not grow? How about, how about disease? I mean, the fact that the U.S. now leads the world in the five chronic non-infectious diseases, you know, that's not a first place position to enjoy. Now, it generates a lot of GDPs and nursing positions and doctor requirements and hospitalizations. But is it what we want to really see grow? How about food allergies, autism? I mean, you know, in just 30 short years, we've gone from 1 in 10,000 to 1 in, what is it now, 68? I mean, this is bad. All right? This is not something to celebrate. Oh boy, now we've got more autistic therapists around. You know, this, this is not good. Campylobacter, E. coli, listeria. All these Latin squiggly words we've learned to say in just, you know, my lifetime. I grew up, you know, I didn't know, it, when I was in high school, I didn't know anybody with a food allergy. Nobody. I mean, the phrase didn't even exist. Some of you over 50, you know what I'm talking about. We didn't know better. Our friends didn't have food allergies. You didn't, you didn't have a, a birthday party and the first question was about gluten intolerance and da -da -da, you know, all this stuff. You know, and and we, didn't, we didn't know the words Campylobacter, Listeria, MRSA, C. diff. I mean, they didn't even exist. Folks, this is not a good thing. This is not good growth, and it, 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 and it, bespeaks, it bespeaks a crumbling of the orthodoxy of the U.S. mindset to see them continue to proliferate. It's not a good thing. How about prisons? Do we want to see more prisons? Probably not. I'm opposed to all prisons. Now, I'm also a believer in whipping posts and dunking and <laughs> debt look at consumer debt look at our you know people talk about the you know the, the national debt well look at look at our in, our, our, in, our our individual debt those of us in this room, I'll bet if I took a poll, there are such heretics in this room that we actually aspire to live debt free. <laughs> you know, I, I go to New York City several times a year to do media things and, and, and do things up there. And, and every time I go, I look around at this thing and I say, what, what drive, what do these people do? I mean, Look at the wealth. I mean, just crazy, crazy wealth. What do they do? And suddenly you realize 3% of every credit card transaction in the world goes through that city. That's what makes it go. Wow. Divorce. Is that something we want to see grow? Dead zones, riparian dead zones. You know, the U.S. now has 700 riparian dead zones. 200 years ago, there wasn't one. Desertification. Dropping aquifers. You know, I was at a xeriscaping conference in Phoenix and listened to a Las Vegas uh, um, public water uh, engineer put up on the slide screen a spreadsheet where in their department they had spent a fair amount of time sussing out the value of a gallon of water, whether it grew a potato or was into a hot tub in a, in a Las Vegas casino hot tub. And what they determined was a gallon of water in a hot tub was worth $250 and a gallon of water growing a potato to feed the people in Las Vegas is only worth 20 cents. Well, guess which one's going to be developed? Not the potato. I found it amazing that somebody actually spends their time <laughs> doing the, the value of that. How about obesity? Is that something we want to see grow? Hospitals, 
laws. Do we want more laws? I mean, the, the Romans had an axiom that you could always tell the vibrancy uh, of a culture by how many laws it had. And there was an and, and, and the, the more the more vapid and fearful and paranoid and timid and 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 uh, uh, anemic and weak a culture became, the more laws they passed because you can't do anything else. So we'll just pass more laws about that. <laughs> taxes. Do we need taxes to go up? More regulations. Dependency on government, violence in schools, military, war, instability, questionable empire building, erosion of our money, ignorance toward food and farming, condescension toward gardening and self. I mean, you just go on and on and on. These are all growing. So, the heretics are prophets who warn about going the way we're going. So, when we take any of these things that I've just described, and warn our neighbors and family and friends and politicians and say, you know, these are not good growth things. They're not good. We're, we're naysayers. We're, we're a cog in the wheel of progress. We're, you know, what do you want to do? Go backwards, you know? And so heretics, we actually aspire to the Chinese proverb that says, you know, if you keep going the way you're going, you're going to end up where you're headed. And so our reversal to all this stuff is the do-it-yourself mentality, self-reliance. So we're busy about gardening, growing our own food, building clotheslines, you know, those things that only poor people have. The ultimate low-tech solar dryer, you know, becoming debt-free, building cisterns for roof water, Hooking up your exercise bicycle, bicycle to pump the water back up on the roof and grow cucumbers on the roof that you can pick them off the windows in the second floor, you know. We, <laughs> see, we believe that there's a day of reckoning in which nature bats less. We believe that. And most of our culture thinks that we're somehow immune to that. Next orthodoxy. I'm pretty close to being done. Next orthodoxy. Rebels are great everywhere in the world except the U.S. <laughs> you know, we, we as a nation, you know, we went and beat the old king of England with pitchforks, right? I mean, you know, we drove off that imperial, rawr, you know, we, we, we carved ourselves out of this, you know, with this, this, this and, and so we, we, don't we, we have an affinity, don't we, to, to the downtrodden and to people that are desperate to throw off despots and stuff around the world. So we, you know, we root for the, the Syrian underdogs, we root for Arab Spring, we root for the Egyptians that are, you know, we root for the Chinese in Tiananmen Square, you know, we root for the Libyans, I mean, you know, we root for the Ukrainians, and, and right? I mean, we root for all these underdogs, but in the U.S., if you dare to want to drink raw milk <laughs> or eat compost grown tomatoes or Aunt Matilda's homemade pickles you're a bioterrorist <laughs> I mean I can assure you that our conventional neighbor farmers and area, because we don't vaccinate our cows, we don't medicate our chickens, and our chickens actually run out and, and rub beaks, you know, beaks, with, with indigo buntings and robins, who then take our diseases to the science-based Tyson and Cargill chicken factories and make them sick and threaten the planet's world food supply, and, and we're going to destroy the planet's food system because our chickens commiserate with indigo bunnings and red-winged blackbirds. <laughs> That's the orthodoxy of our day, and so we're called typhoid Mary, bioterrorists. The heretics believe, the heretics believe that how a nation treats its lunatic fringe determines its freedom. Throughout history, throughout history, 
all of the antidotes to the, to the flawed orthodoxy of the day always came from lunatic fringes, from rebels, this, 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 this basic innovation. And it's part of a vibrant, virulent, youthful culture that says, you want to go smoke marijuana? You want to go drink raw milk? That's cool. You, know, you want to go, you know, unvaccinate your kids? That's cool. You know, a nation that's strong and vibrant and virile and youthful and energetic and enthusiastic embraces the lunatic fringe because that's where innovation comes from. And, it, and, it, and it's a sign of, a, of an imploding, collapsing culture that is scared about these new ideas like drinking raw milk or, or growing a garden or having two chickens in your house instead of a cat or a dog <laughs> to eat your kitchen scraps and give you eggs, okay? Next, the orthodoxy of our day is that cheap food is a national entitlement. That's another orthodoxy of our day. I mean, boy, if I get that, that is the most common question I get everywhere around the world. A, can we feed the world this way? And absolutely, it's the only way to feed the world. And number two, can we afford it? Well, you know, I always like to ask people, you know, now, I know nobody here right now, nobody in this auditorium um, is spending money on anything you don't need. I, I understand that. So we're going to talk about the people out there. That, that aren't in here? Is there anything the people out there are spending money on that they don't need? Yeah. What? TV. TV. You know, I did, I, you got to be careful about liberal universities when you do this. I did this at George Washington University and a kid right over here yelled out, underwear! No, 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 no. <laughs> Starbucks! Yeah. Cigarettes! SUVs. What would you say, plumbers? <laughs> Junk food. McDonald's. Yes. Uh, Las Vegas. Hollywood. Walt Disney. <laughs> See, we ha we have we have the money to buy what we need to be, and, and our cheap food orthodoxy um, has this, this, kind of, this kind of flow through idea that you know, farmers should be low paid, should be few, and dark skinned. Whoa. Heretics like us? We say you get what you pay for, and if you want an integrity food system, it doesn't matter what skin color you have, it's the most noble, sacred profession in the world, and we ought to put our best and brightest into this food system. And so, we actually have the unmitigated gall to encourage the Jeffersonian intellectual agrarian. And I ask urban foodie groups, I say, okay, you guys, you want good quality food? Yeah, you know, the chorus, yes, yeah, we want good quality food, all right. What are you gonna think when, you're, when the next Saturday at farmer's market you go and your farmer's driving a brand new Mercedes Benz? How are you gonna feel? Are you gonna be able to feel happy? or are you gonna assume he's gouging you? Why is it that the heart surgeon, when he pulls up in a new Mercedes Benz, we think that's a sign of success. When a farmer pulls up in a new Mercedes Benz, we think he's taking advantage of us. Now, just for the record, I don't aspire to drive a Mercedes Benz, okay? But it's the mentality, you see, it's the attitude, it's the spirit. How important is that? Do we really want our most innovative, best, and brightest young people? You know, in the next 15 years, 50% of the, 
of America's farmland is going to change hands because the average American farmer is now bumping 60 years old in the US. That means that, that, that more than 50% of all agricultural assets in the country are owned by people who are done being innovative. Now the question is, what's going to happen to the 50% of that land? Is it going to be gobbled up by you know, the Japanese, the Chinese, the multinational corporations, the GPS-driven you know, robotic uh, tractors? Uh, you know, is it going to be gobbled up by large industrial farms? Or, or is it going to be caressed by a new generation of young, entrepreneurial, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, self-starter, intellectually uh, agrarian young people who love it and nurture it and massage our womb into its desire of abundance like it's been wanting to do. That's a place. And to talk like that puts you in the position of a heretic. You know, that what, you, what you mean we should have more farmers? Yes! What's wrong with another million farmers? That would be great, because you know what? Then we'd have more eyes, more ears, and more hands participating. And when you have more of this sensual participation, you know what? You get more integrity because you have more accountability because there are more people seeing and, and people aren't, aren't banned from their food system with razor wire security uh, places and people with you know, guns in a holster keeping you from going and visiting an opaque food system. Finally, finally, the orthodoxy of our day is all problems must be solved at the federal government level. <laughs> now, Brian Welch has made it very clear that their uh, uh, customer uh, database shows that half of the subscribers to Mother Earth News label themselves as ultra-liberal, and half label themselves as ultra-conservative. <laughs> so I am very cognizant that I, as, a, as a Christian libertarian environmentalist capitalist lunatic here, I, I feel like Paul with the Sadducees and the Pharisees, you know? and uh, going to be torn apart. But, but, but I, I want to leave you with this thought, um, b because, because we do, all of us, we, I think we can agree that there's tremendous dysfunction, partisanship, all sorts of, you know, there's a, you know, did you know that there are now 35 states with active secession organizations in them? The most active one is in um, Vermont. The, the, um, I wish they'd repent for what they did to us in 1861, but anyway. Um, anyway, I want to leave you with this. The, the problem with arrogating all problems to the federal level is that it denies the culture, the prototype small-scale innovations that local and state governments to, can bring to problems. And the, the problem is that when every, every solution has to be solved at a federal level, and I'm talking about wages, education, housing, health care, you name it, okay, whatever, all right, when it gets arrogated to the federal level, the stakes are so high, it's a winner-take-all, that it, it creates bitterness and partisanship that doesn't occur when you have violently opposed opinions on a local level where the solutions can be tried on a small scale and innovation can be done embryonically where it's not a winner take all and we can try it over here they can try something over there they can try something over there and we can all look at each other and say well what seems to be working and we can learn from this 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 uh, um, ballet of different players and so I think as a as, as a culture it is time to appreciate 
that, that decentralizing decision making, decentralizing regulatory power actually empowers innovation and, and, and small scale experiments that aren't winners take all, where the stakes aren't so large. And then we can talk to each other as localities and as innovators and triers. And so uh, uh, the problem is that when you have the regulatory environment that you have today all coming down from the federal level, it's incredibly local, state, and small citizen prejudicial. It's a one size fits all deal. Trust me, our chicken doesn't even look like, taste like, handle like, it doesn't, it's nothing like a Tyson chicken. And so regulations for Tyson are not appropriate for a backyard operation. And that's why, that's why I'm a big believer in the Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund and everybody who values our food freedom should join the Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund. In the, in the two-tier concept, that, that those of us who are so heretical that we would actually take responsible for our own food decision making, our own food for our own three trillion member internal community of beings, that we should be allowed the freedom to opt out of the sanctioned fare that gets a federal government stamp. And if we would do that, and allow that sort of neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor consenting adult voluntary commerce to occur from these ranks of heretics would spring forth an absolute revolution of integrity food from our gardens, our backyards, our home kitchens that would flow out into our communities with affordable, integrity, transparent, accountable food that would topple the corporate empires of our country overnight. So, wear the mantra of heretic proudly. Wear it proudly. Enjoy it. Don't be moping around, I'm a hair. No, be empowered and enjoy the laughter and the, and the humor that comes with calling yourself a heretic. Because I think it's a, it's a fun way to position ourselves in juxtaposition as the antidote for everything that our neighbors and family members and all those people, all those people that are out there that didn't make it here today, all those people are, are, go to bed every day fearful of, paranoid of, and disempowered about. We have those answers. So enjoy being a heretic and enjoy wearing the mantra proudly and enjoyably realizing we are the solution, not the problem. Now, may all of your carrots grow long and straight. May your radishes be large and not pithy. Um, may uh, a blossom end rot attack your uh, Monsanto neighbor's uh, 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 tomatoes. May the coyotes be struck blind at your pasture chickens. May all of your culinary experiments be delectably palatable. May the rain fall gently on your fields. The wind be always at your back. Your children rise and call you blessed. And may we all make our nest a better place than we inherited. Thank you so much for letting me visit with you. Heretics Unite. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.